Welcome everybody to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. My name is Ray. I am your humble reviewer. Uh, and today I'll be reviewing many a book that are relevant to the Lit RPG community. They'll either be classic or current uh, Lit RPG novels that are in audio form. Uh, and before I do that, though, I do want to say um, that, hey, check out my new swag. I got myself a Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast logo inside. Uh, what do you call it? Stitched up thing of a ball bar on my chest there. I think it looks pretty neat. I like it. <laughs> Better? Better. Good. Yeah, so I'm pretty proud of that. I, I get to wear a shirt. Now, I can wear this to work and everything, which I probably end up doing since we just had another call come through a second ago. So, <laughs> um, stay tight. Stay tuned. We're going to get right into this in a minute. Okay. First book for the day is I Am Gamer by Gabriel Rathweg. Narrated by Gabriel Rathwig. Produced by Gabriel Rathwig. Soundman, Gabriel Rathwig. Boom, Gabriel Rathwig. Mike, Gabriel Rathwig. I'm sorry, I'm getting out of control here. Um, Gabriel Rathwig does, does a lot here. Um, with a book length of 8 hours and 18 minutes. Chapter 1. Track 1. Blister in the Sun by the Violent Femmes. The day was perfect. A bright blue sky, as wide as the eye could see, with puffy white clouds that were scattered randomly across the perfect tableau, dominated my view. Which, while beautiful, it was in complete contrast to my mood and really did not make me feel the way it should have. As a matter of fact, I would have preferred a thunderstorm replete with dark gray clouds and lightning bolts firing staccato blasts from the heavens to this beautiful, picturesque morning. My bike roared as I gunned the engine and sped up, passing the old beat-up teal and white Chevy pickup in front of me. Glancing to the side as I passed, I looked in the cab of the truck and my eyes widened. Inside was a super hot redhead driving the POS truck. She looked over at the same instant and we locked eyes. So, I Am Gamer is, is one of those books that satisfies several of my loves all at once. Um, I love mythology, I love lit RPG, and I love time travel. So, you, you put any of those things together, and I'm really going to be interested right off the bat. Okay, they're good combos, you can't go wrong for a good story. And this is one of those rare books that I always say is either brilliant or it's insane. Because this is where the author actually decided to narrate his own book. Woo! Yep, he did it. He went crazy and did this all on his own. Um, now, personally, I admire such courage. And I always hope that there's a writer out there that does such a thing because they know their characters so well that they feel like they're the only ones that can handle those nuanced emotions and vocal stresses that a narrator has to guess at. Um, because a narrator can only assume that they know what the writer was thinking when they wrote something. Sometimes they might actually be able to get some hints. But that, that's the fact is that they're just getting clues. So here's where I'm going to start with the narration. Now, Gabriel asked me to be kind. Now, I'm going to be honest. That's probably the better thing to be here. Um, you can pretty much tell that this was not a high-end audio booth technology that was used. Um, I'm sure that whatever he used uh, was good, but it doesn't feel the same as a professional audio production. And again, I'm not trying to take off anything. I don't know what he did. He could have been in the sound booth, but it doesn't quite have that same tinge. I think there was a, there was a novel, um, uh, Steam Whistle Alley by Joshua Mason, where I said that there was just something off with the narration for part of the book. And then after that, it just picked up and it was fine, but it bothered me up until that point. And I had several narrators get back to me and they said, oh, you can tell that the, the narrator there was using a lower quality microphone and then it switched over to a better mic. They got a better mic and it made it sound better and clearer and all this. And I think this is the same thing here. I don't know what he used. For all I know, he used his own cell phone and recorded stuff, which is a distinct possibility, but it does sound a little bit off. Um, so that's just one little thing. I just want to put that out there. Secondly, the story could have used some better, um, vocal editing, sound editing. There were several times I heard things repeat, just just a couple times here and there, but it, it did happen. Now, I'm going to be fair and say that I actually enjoyed hearing Rathwig doing the various voices and telling story his way because it's his story and he's the guy that's telling it. You don't get that a lot. And I know it took a huge amount of time to produce this book the way that he wanted it. And I don't hold his vocal prowess against him at all. I think that he does a really good job. There were a couple of times where he's 
he sounds like he's a little bit out of, uh, he needs water or something, moisture. But that was the characters talking. But he does a really good job for a first-timer and for not being a narrator. Uh, I've heard professional narrators not handle characters this well and not be able to tell a story this well. They've completely flubbed it. Uh, but I did get an honest chuckle with how Rathweg made very certain to properly pronounce certain words. So as he was going through it, I'll just say, um, I can't remember what they were, but when he was going through it, he would be like, equipment uh, so that you know there was no question as to what he was saying you know what like he was saying equipment he was very specific he was like equipment and so on and so forth and I know that's not a word that he used I'm just giving you an example as I can remember it um, I've read listened to too many books for me to be able to pull back and say I remember this exactly because I didn't take notes um, but it was just funny that he did that because it's almost like he heard somebody else in an audiobook say supposedly rather than supposedly, or ensigns as opposed to ensigns. And he tried to sidestep those floor traps. Um, this isn't like a Netflix uh, nailed it moment or a whatever, but for a DIY novel, an audiobook, it has legs. Uh, but if I'm honest, I suggest that you use a legit narrator in the future because I always say this, and this is no disrespect for you, Gabriel, at all. Um, like I said, I think you did a pretty good job here. Um, a, a good narrator will elevate a decent story to being better and a better story will be great. And a pro could have really skyrocketed this tale. Uh, like I say, it's not that you didn't do a good job, but it would have been cleaner. It would have sounded a little bit better. Um, and it, like I say, they add things in sometimes that I think that we as non narrators just don't understand that needs to be there. Um, as for the writing, I really enjoyed the story. The MC was a cool dude. He feels genuine. Sometimes the dialogue might have been a little bit off, but it was overall, it was fun. Uh, I will never complain about time travel stories at all. I've been addicted to time travel since I was a kid. And I first watched the time tunnel, which that really dates me, I'm sure, because I know 90% of the audience out there has never heard of the time tunnel. Um, but I, I watched it as a kid. Um, and I think Gabriel handles the time travel aspects pretty well. For the most part, um, Time travel is one of those iffy things because it can be dangerous. It, you know, there are all kinds of stupid paradoxes that you can miss or not catch or things that you do that you don't realize have implications. Um, so I, you know, for example, I don't know if he would really have had to teach indigenous people certain things, but hey, I suspend my disbelief and say they didn't know it. I mean, that's just all there is to it. Um, if they didn't know it, they didn't know it and he had to show them. That's all. Uh, you know, I, I know that that could be a, an issue for some people. Me, uh, it's just the way the story goes. I like the mythology aspect of it, and we get we get game mechanics that are familiar, which I appreciate. I hate, 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 hate having to learn complicated gaming styles just so that they're different from you know standard lit RPG stuff. Uh, those styles just drain the fun right out of the story. I, I will say the MP does start out in the MP. The MC starts out a little OP pretty quickly. Um, it's balanced out by his opponents being overpowered as well. Um, I do get picky about overly strong characters, but just like in the Good Guy series by by Eric Ugland, it, this proves you can have an overpowered hero or MC so long as there's a balance. And and I get that here. I get that a lot that there's balance. In fact, I don't know if he's really OP so much as he's like just better than normal guys. You know, like he's just like, hey, um, you guys, you know, I'm smart. I don't forget things. I can do this. I can do that. And that's where he elevates himself up above, I think. Um, for me, the real standout is the way in which, which we get to see the Native American mythology employed. Uh, I don't think I've ever read that in a lit RPG novel before, and that was fun, fun as hell. Um, the catch here is the gods want to kind of little bighorn the entire Go West young man movement before that ever catches on. And uh, this is not a How the West Was Lost book but how the West was closed for business. Um, it's a cool concept, and it gets played pretty well. I really enjoyed this. Uh, the book is fun. There were a few hiccups that could have been skirted with some pro professional editing sound-wise. Um, sorry, I just can't overlook that. You know, Hiccups are hiccups, uh, no matter who does it. So if it was Andrea Parsnow or Luke Daniels, I'd have said there are hiccups. Um, so I have, to, I have to point those out. I, I like that the book has a sort of a playlist to go along with, and that was fun. Um, my final score is going to be, just because the audio is is a little little wonky sounding to me for some reason i don't know and if you had a professional booth i apologize but it does, just does not sound as clear or as, as 
as it should to me. And with the hiccups, I will be taking a couple points off there. So um, it's an eight-star book, but I think it, it 7.8 for the audio, it just could have benefited from a more professional touch. And that's not to say I, I'm recommending that you don't continue doing this on your own. Gabriel, honestly, if you want to uh, do this again, power to you. You, you only get better with practice, uh, and I can't see you hurting yourself with it. Um, so give it a shot. Um, but like I said, I think that the wiser course of action is for the amount of effort that you put into doing that, you could have been writing more. Um, I would go with a professional from this point forth just to make it easier on me. Um, but that's up to you. I mean, say you, you, you do it. I'm there with you. I, I will stick with it. The book is fun. It is very enjoyable. And a lot of neat concepts get coming, you know, coming to play. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a quantum leap fan. Um, uh, you know, I'm, not Beverly Hills Cop. My gosh, my 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 mind does not work this early in the morning. Uh, and uh, just so you know, I've had to re-record all these because the first time I recorded all these episodes or the segments, there was no sound. So I've had to go back and redo this <laughs> because I'm smart. Uh, and I, I like I said in one of the segments, um, I'm smart, but I do dumb things. And this was one of those dumb things where I didn't check to see if the sound is on, and I can't tell their sound until after I've uploaded it to Ramon. Um, and so when I went there, I looked at it, and I hit play just to see if what it sounded like, there was nothing there. So I've had to come back and redo this. Um, so I'm probably forgetting a couple things that I said before. Um, but I, I think that in this case, that's a prime example of why you need a professional. Uh, because I've done this, like I say, 180, I don't know how many segments I've done. Um, since last year, I did 90 segments. And so I know I probably had about 170 segments, 170 different books I've reviewed. Um, and I still muck up certain things from time to time and have to go back and redo it. So that, that is my point to you is that um, no matter what you do, you can still make errors and fix them, but it takes more time to do that than it should. Like I should not be redoing this at nine o'clock in the morning before I have families coming in here to meet at 11. I should have this all squared away. So um, that's just the way it is. But 7.8 stars. And I, I'm sure next time you're going to improve a little bit more. I look forward to this, Second book, uh, I think the story is really good and it's it's got it's got good legs. So the series is is going to hold up. I just just want to see it get a little bit of a kick, give it a boost. All right, that will be it. Seven point eight stars. Thank you. All right, so this book that I'm going to review is Kill Dozer, Arbiter Corps, Book One, uh, by Corey Gaffner, narrated by Eric Brian Moore with a book length of 7 hours and 22 minutes. The sound of Hank's voice in the morning always surprised him. It normally sounded like he was gargling marbles when he spoke because his voice was such a deep and broken baritone. But in the mornings, it sounded like he was gargling broken glass. At least until he got the drink in him. Hank figured this was one of the side effects of already having a deep voice and then shouting at work crews on various construction sites for over a decade. Where did I leave that drink anyway? Ah, there it is, thought Hank. Half a bottle of lukewarm malt liquor from the night before. He guzzles it all down in one giant gulp. Ew, Hanky, that's nasty. You just aren't used to being around a real man. Now get up and get out, woman, unless you're making breakfast. If you're cooking, you can stay a while. Oh, Hanky, you're so funny. The pounding on his door resumed. Bang, bang, bang. He wondered if the lot lizard knew he wasn't joking. So this is where I come clean with you. <clears throat> I'm going to come clean here right, right now and just be honest with you. I was a little devastated by this book in the direction where it went. Uh, I'm sure that most of you, when you hear the word killdozer, you automatically think of when the one crazy guy welded the armor onto his bulldozer and drove across town trying to commit acts of murder and mayhem and only managed to get himself killed in the process doing a slight bit of property damage. I mean, I'm sure that's who you think about or what you think about. And I, I know that this is probably the, the act that actually inspired this book just from the, the events that occur in this book. Um, but me, me, no, I'm a horror junkie. Uh, if you ever listen to me in my show here, you know I talk about it. I will tell you all the time. I'm a horror fan, first and foremost. Um, everything about horror, monsters, uh, blood, spatter, gore, that, that is right up my alley. I'm a funeral director for Pete's sake. Um, <clears throat> so the first time I heard the word killdozer, 
I automatically thought of the old Clint Walker flick in which a bulldozer comes to life and starts greasing construction guys. I think Ramon's going to put up somewhere, you can see the old TV guide ad, if you guys even know what a TV guide is, um, talking about this coming on 8.30 and why. Why was it 8.30? Because it was so scary, kids could not watch it at 8 o'clock. They had to be in bed. That's how horrifying this book was. I mean, this this, this movie was. Okay. Um, plus, you know, you have to give this movie credit because it predated the 77 horror flick, The Car, by three years. And the car, which if you see that, um, and then let's compare the car poster to the movie poster for Killdozer. You can see the car looks creepy, but Killdozer just, it kicks ass. You know, it's got kill over the bull word. It's awesome. Um, it predated the car by three years, but the car, the movie The Car, is what inspired Stephen King to write Christine. So Killdozer inspired The Car, which inspired Stephen King, which created Christine. And you can see Christine right there. And yeah, I know that's a crappy pick of a 57 Chevy, but honestly, if you read the book, that's pretty much what the car looked like uh, before they, they started fixing it up. It was a POS that just barely looked like a vehicle. Um, anyway, and I don't want to have a nice fancy car here. I want to look crappy. Like, look at the killdozer that the guy um, used. I mean, you see that killdozer? Uh, the killdozer right there that is, is just, it's, it's a, it looks like a big chunk of concrete on top of a, a bulldozer is what it looks like. It, it doesn't look like a bulldozer anymore. Um, so, you know, this is like an inspirational thing right down the line, um, for, for everything that was done. So, I mean, hell, if you want to even get, get honest about it, Marvel Comics, Marvel Comics was even inspired and did a Killdozer comic book. Killdozer comic book. An issue that I actually have. Yes, I've been collecting comics since 1970. Um, so I've got a lot of books. Uh, if it came out, I probably have it. So, so I was all set, when I say this very sincerely, I was all set for some madcap killing by a boy and his dozer, which wasn't what I got. Not at all. Instead, Killdozer plays out exactly like the start of the rampage that Marvin John Hemeyer, yeah, you gotta say all three names or it isn't right, went on before he got killed. You know, John Hankley Jr., you know, John Wilkes Booth, John Hemeyer, no, Marvin John Hemeyer. I got into that John phase. I'm sorry. Does everybody named John do some killing? Sirhan Sirhan doesn't have that. So, okay, it doesn't count. It's only two two names. So you can't really count Sirhan Sirhan. Um, but anyway, um, you, you know, the MC Hank is probably kind of a, a remnant of his spirit uh, because Hank has been pushed around. He, he's been uh, broken financially by some unscrupulous individuals uh, for pa perceived past wrongs, things that they think that he should never have done to them, uh, they're now getting back at him. So when we get to his initial assault on City Hall, that's where things take a severe turn. Because I'm expecting, okay, he's built the killdozer. They, they, they're expecting this to happen. He is going to take out some people and do some things and get some justice. And whoop, we take a... A left turn or did I turn right? I, I don't know. I was on the, the camera. But um, either way, it takes a severe left turn. And I have to say right away, even though I didn't get the story I was hoping for or expecting, I still enjoy this tale a lot. Um, Hank is one hell of an awesome character uh, that you just really can't help but like. I mean, he he's kind of like um, Ron Swanson on steroids with a take no crap from anybody kind of vibe and attitude. Um, like you said, you just can't help but like the dude. Um He's he's the kind of guy that would say, I didn't start the fight, but I sure as hell am going to be the one to finish it. Uh, he carries the entire story on his huge shoulders. Uh, and to be honest with you, if the character of Hank didn't work, neither would this story. The story would have failed just in so many ways if Hank hadn't been um, a person of interest, a POI. Um, because he, he is somebody that keeps you captivated the moment he's on the 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 sound waves, I guess. Um, the moment he comes on, you're just captivated by Hank because he is gruff, he's tough, he's mean. Um, sometimes he can be nasty. 
But that's just a layer of protection he's built up because of the things that's happened to him over the years. To the people that he is, um, you know, who, who he's who's shown loyalty and, and things like that, he's a really nice guy, and he's not tough and, and cruel. Um, he's very generous. So you can see, you know, there's a veneer of, I'm, I'm not going to take crap because I've been given it for so long, uh, compared to, you know, I'm, I'm going to help people that need to help. Um, he goes out of his way in several spots to make sure that people in his employ are cared for if something happens to him. Um, so, you know, he's hardcore, but not unfeeling. He's tough and fair and principled. And that's the important thing. So the, the, the issue that happens here is, is the story sort of diverges from a man going on a rampage into um, him joining the Green Lantern Corps or the Nova Corps, depending on which side of the comic book street you're in. Um, since I'm talking about comic books already, um, I'm going to say, you know, there's the Nova Corps, which is from Marvel, and, and there's the Green Lantern Corps, which is from DC, and both are just a mishmash of different aliens from different cultures joining a police corps, police, police force, um, you know, cosmically. And that is what the Arbiter Corps is. It's basically the Green Lantern Corps or the Nova Corps um, in this series. And he has been offered an opportunity to join it. And this is where the lit portion of the book comes in. Now, just to be fair, um, if you're offered an opportunity to join an intergalactic police force, you got to say, what's the first thing you're going to power up? You know, Maybe you're going to say, I'll power up my shotgun. No, you're going to power up your killdozer. Um, so then that's when I started thinking, hell yeah, the killdozer is really going to go. Um, but like I say, my big story with the, sto my big issue with the story isn't the fact that it's not a horror story. It's the fact that the killdozer really doesn't do a lot of killdozing. Doesn't do it a lot. It's, it's a minimal usage. Honestly, there's a couple spots where it plays in. I really wanted more killdozer to appear, um, more killdozer stuff. But anytime there is killdozer, um, that's where the lit comes in. Um, it, because this is more like, the story is more like a donut with its cream filled with icing on top. And then the lit stuff, the lit RPG stuff is sprinkled on like nice little multicolored sprinkles, donuts, um, for, for effect, for flavor. It's delicious and fun, but it's not really necessary for that donut. Okay. I mean, it's there. Um, so, you know, if you're really wanting some hardcore, heavy lit stuff this is not going to be your style uh now like me as long as it's got something in there i'm cool with it and I, i'm cool with this uh it works the story is fun and the killdozer is exciting when it is employed uh so you know i can't complain but if, you, if you're looking for 100 percent lit all the way around every time it's not going to quite be there um that means the story is really good because that's what kept me going is, is reading the story uh uh, and this didn't really depend on like stats and quests to make it happen. It was character driven and the story was there. It was put out there and, and it was just enjoyable. Uh, it's interesting and it's involving and it's because of the characters. Now Moore, who is a newcomer to the genre, does really well. And I actually have one of his earlier audiobooks. Um, it's called The Undead Pool, which is an obvious parody of a well known Marvel superhero, which has got the initials of DP. Um, and I, I loved him in that. I really did. I thought he was just funny as get out. Um, also, he narrates um, this this series of books called The Bulletproof Adventures of Damien Stockwell, which I've been kind of considering um, getting because they look fun. Uh, they look kind of pulpy, and that's how they, they kind of come across to me. And I've been thinking about getting them, and I think this has kind of pushed me in that direction, solidifying my decision to do it. Um, because if he does so, such a good job here and in and, and the Undead Pool, um, I think that he can handle it because he, he, if you listen to Undeadpool, um, it's not that he doesn't sound the same, but it's a completely different vibe, different voices, um, as opposed to here. I mean, it really comes across differently. And so that means he's got a wide range of capabilities vocally that you don't see as often as you would like. Um, Moore really does a fantastic job and he plays both genders well. He manages to instill you with the frustration that poor Hank is going through. He keeps the pace going and there adds the emotion in as needed because there are times that this is, this book is emotional. Uh, and he makes it feel like it's easy for him to do so. So this is somebody I would like to see hit the community with a bigger splash in the future. Um, and I really debated on this. Um, 
like 8.1, 8.2 stars. And, you know, the, the lack of lit, I could see that being annoying to some people. But I'm going to say 8.2 just because um, it was a good story. But uh, next time around, I'm going to have to hold it a little bit harder to the fire for book two uh, because there needs to be more Killdozer. If you name the book Killdozer, there needs to be a lot of Killdozing going on. And secondly, there should be a little bit more lit RPG. So second book will be a little bit more scrutinized by me, um, especially point-wise. I'll start shaving stuff off if I think I have to. Um, but uh, this was a fun book. And like I say, I enjoyed every second of it. So, you know, whether it, it, you're a Green Lantern fan or a, a Nova Corps, which I'm Nova Corps, um, it doesn't matter. The Arbiters sound like they're fun. I look forward to seeing them in action in space unless he's stuck on Earth uh, doing his thing there, which is a distinct possibility, just like Hal Jordan from the Green Lanterns and uh, Richard Ryder from Nova. They're the Earth people, and they're the ones that police Earth. I could see you know, Hank being the Earth dude periodically getting pulled into space for certain things, either to get reprimanded or to get instructions or to go fight somebody that's, you know, cosmically inclined to destroy things. So, you know, I, I think there's a lot of potential here for the series, but next time around, I really need more Killdozer and maybe a little bit more lit stuff happening, just because, okay? All right, next book is One More Last Time, a lit RPG game lit novel, The Good Guys, book one, by Eric Ugland, uh, narrated by Neil Helligers, with a book length of seven hours and 43 minutes. What do I do? I finally asked. Fill out the forms, press accept, live your new life like you told me you wished you would live this one. I don't get what this is going to do, old man. Give it a try. The phone started to crackle, and I took a peek at it, down from full bars to one. I think they've got a cell phone jammer, I said. Good luck. I hope to see you the next time around, Norman said. Thank you, I said, but I have no idea if he heard it. The phone cut out. I stared at the screen. It was the usual rigmarole for an RPG. Name, sex, race, distribute attribute points, choose starting location, stuff that normally, you know, if I was going to be playing a game, I'd have relished taking my time with. If I'd had time, I'd have been effusive with my praise for the developers giving so many options to the players. The list of races and places was seemingly endless. Instead, I cursed at them, clicking through as fast as I could, selecting random any time I could. Finally, I clicked submit. Okay, so I came into the series with really low expectations. I mean, low expectations. Honestly, the reason why I did have low expectations for this series is because if you look at the covers, they're not the best things to pull you in. Uh, they kind of look cheap, quick, hokey. Um, and, and, you know, I, I used to, way back when, when I was just doing reviews uh, on Audible, on the websites, you know, that sort of thing, I, I would often talk about how a book's cover helped me. Because, to be fair about it, um, with The Divine Dungeon... If the Divine Dungeons black and white covers had been on the Audible book, I'd have never picked it up. Um, as interesting as it sounds and the premise and, and all that, uh, the thing that drew me in was the artwork for Divine Dungeon, Dungeon Born, in the audio section. And I always wondered why the heck they had the, the black and white stuff. Uh, and I didn't know if like Dakota was doing that by hand himself or if he had a friend from school doing it or whatever. Um, but it just did not tell me this, we want to sell this book. Um, and so, like I say, to me, artwork is really, really important. Uh, and I tried to, like when I did covers for my books, I was very specific on exactly how I wanted them to look, what I wanted on there. And I tried to find the artist I thought did a really good job. So um, as we went through things, I always say the cover is what sells the story. It doesn't matter how great your story is. If you got a cruddy cover, it is not going to get people to buy the book. And so, you know, I, I'd heard about these books and I had contacted the author. And then after I picked the books up, I looked at the covers and I'm like, well, it's a good thing I picked these up already because if I had, had not done that, um, I don't think I'd have picked up the series to review it just because the covers don't 
really jump out and scream at me to buy this book. Um, no, I'm not saying they're they're horrible, but you know um, they're not amazing covers. And I'm not trying to bash anybody, but you know these books are so good; they deserve so much better uh, than seeing some guys back for the first three books or four books or five books. Um, you, there's really so much more you could do with this uh, than what you're getting. Um, and it's the same thing with a good cover. I will try not to let a good cover sucker me in, but I'm going to tell you right now, a good cover will make me stop and look at what the story's about before a crappy cover. You know, crappy cover, I'm going to like, nope, 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 and just keep going until I get something that catches my eye. Because that cover is the first thing you see when you're looking for it. You can pull up and you can say, I'm looking for time travel stories. And crappy covers are going to dissuade me every single time. Uh, no matter what happens. So this was one of those books that I was like, well, I don't know. I don't know what this is going to do, but I'm worried about it. Anyway, um, this is going to be one of those books where I, I kind of talk about the main book, the first book, but I'm also going to talk about the other two books a little bit because this is a series. Um, and I have to say, by chapter three of this book, I was so enthralled and so sucked in that I just kept going after the first book was over. I had three books. They were right there. I didn't stop. I went one, two, three. I would have went four if I had the fourth book immediately. I would have done it without question, without hesitation. Um, I want the fourth book right now. It, this series is so amazing. Uh, it just sucked me right in. Uh, this book hit every single mark it was supposed to with me. First and foremost, it got me into the game quickly. Incredibly important incredibly important. We didn't go to 35% of the way before we got to the game. Um, it happens really early on, right out of the gate. And that's how I prefer my lit books, or any book for that matter. Get to the action, give me the inciting incident, um, and then I can enjoy the story. Uglin does exactly that. Secondly, the MC enters the game in a pretty cool and unique way. Uh, especially like how he, he was allowed to bring things in from the real world uh, to the game world for special perks. Now, not that he knew that, but he did it by accident. But uh, if he had read through all this stuff, like the Eula and the uh, Jazz, he'd have seen he could have grabbed stuff and taken it with him. And, and in return, gotten different stuff. And third... We get to see that the MC isn't perfect, and he does do stupid things in spite of being smart. Now, I had heard, um, just, just from talking to people, that the MC was pretty stupid, and it took away from the believability. But what I saw were instances of him not thinking his way through completely when he was faced with a problem, or just relying on his abilities to get him out of danger. And that's most people. I, I, I really just think that most people don't use 100% of their mind all the time when they're faced with some sort of dilemma. Uh, especially when there is a dilemma, most people tend to crumble. They fall apart. They don't act intelligently. They do crazy things. They do stupid things. And to me, this was a, a very natural, realistic reaction that the MC Montana has throughout the series. And he does seem to be getting a little bit better as the series goes on. He starts thinking more, doing smarter things. But in, in overall, if you were tossed into a game and you have superpowers, whether it's magic or whatever you want to, you know, super strength or super speed or, you know, whatever it's going to be, you're going to say, well, I can fly. I'm going to fly my way out of there. And, and that's just the way I think most people would deal with it. Uh, they wouldn't try to think of something else. They'd be like, well, I can fly. So I'm just going to fly above their heads and go get out of here. And, and that's the way the MC handles things because he has abilities and he's going to rely on those abilities more than he is himself if he didn't have them. Uh, and honestly, it made me feel like I was reading about myself going into a game. I'm a fairly intelligent person, at least I like to think so, but I do stupid things all the time, most notably in social situations. So I totally get how the MC handled himself. Really do. Um, I don't think he's a stupid character. I think he is a realistic character. Also, while you know Montana comes off as being overpowered, it certainly does not feel that way. Not to me, at least. Uh, I think that there are perks that Montana has that he kind of lucked into and in in, in he exploits in a standard way. But the fact is, he uses his openness for some utterly cool events that don't hurt the readability of the book at all. I, I think it makes it more enjoyable. Um, the best thing about this book, however, is that while it's certainly a slice-of-life story, 
which you know I'm not a big fan of and I'm really struggling to wrap my head around and enjoy, um, this feels more like a serialized TV show. And I can only say that now because I have read book one, two, and three. And each book picks up right where the other one left off. So this happens in book one. Book two picks up right from that second. Literally, they back it up about a half a paragraph. You don't get, and thankfully, you do not get shoved down your throat, a recap of what happened in book one. Now, maybe they do in the, the ebooks or the paperback, but in the audio, they don't. It picks up, this one leaves off right here, and they pick up three sentences where this one was and starts the story right here. It is very serialized. Um, it feels like a serialized TV show like Breaking Bad or Game of Thrones before Game of Thrones really sucked, um, in which every episode is a self-contained tale but leads into the next book and there is a bigger overarching story that is being told. Very clearly, that is the case here. Um, seriously, I'm not a huge fan of Slice of Life and this does not carry that tone to me at all. Not at all. It does not make me go, oh my God, this is such... A wandering, you know, monk in the, in the desert kind of thing. No, this carries the feel of a single episode in a larger, more planned out story. This is totally a one of those Netflix and chills type of audiobooks where you just want to binge listen to the entire series in one go. And I'm not recommending you wait till Eric finishes the series because first off, he needs money for what he's doing uh, to complete the series. But secondly, because the, the series is, each book is about seven to eight hours long. Uh, so you couldn't just sit down and listen to them one after another, no matter how good they are. Uh, because you do have to sleep, you have to eat, you probably have to work. Uh, and, and it's a good way to spend a vacation, you know, eight hours a day on seven days to get through it. That'd be fantastic. But this is just something that you would say, if this was Netflix, you do the whole series at once. You wouldn't be able to stop it. Uh, and that's, I would love to see this become a Netflix series. This is just amazing. It's a good, good series. Now, not all is kosher in Ugland. Um, I'm sorry, Eric, that's a bad pun. But I did have at least one issue with the first book. Uh, and that's where the stats and powers and character sheets were just done over and over and over and over again to a point where it was like a well that Eric kept going to to boost the word count here and there, as far as I could tell. But as the series goes on, it does kind of peter out more and more. So I noticed that like by book three, we weren't having that as often or as frequently as we did in book one. Book one, it is, it is pretty overwhelming. My wife even commented uh, that she was tired of hearing the character sheets read out from start to finish A to Z all the way through. Um, and, and she hardly is ever around me when I listened to them, but it seemed like every time she walked into the room when I was doing something, that was what was was on the, the exact same thing. She's like, didn't you just listen to this an hour ago? And I have to explain, well, there was changes made and he did this and that. So it, it really stands out in that aspect. Um, but I don't think that after the first book, it's is quite as overwhelming. And definitely by book two and three, the end of book three, it's kind of lessened up to a really good extent. Don't know about book four. I really want to get book four though. So um, just want to put that out there. Neil Helligers keeps popping up more and more in his little RPG books lately. Uh, and, and I am a fan. Uh, sometimes I think he just does okay. Uh, but for me, it's the material more than it is him. Um, for example, I think he was perfect in The Great Filter. I love The Great Filter right up until the second to last chapter. The last chapter ruined the entire book for me and made me very upset. And Neil did not fit the theme or the tone or anything of that last chapter, but he had no choice but to read it. And as much as he didn't fit, he did a good job, but it, it just didn't didn't work, in my opinion. Once that had happened, there was a change. They shifted gears, and they should have brought somebody else in to finish it. And as much as you don't usually do that, um, that was a case where it, it should have been done because Neil just did not fit that part. And again, it's nothing to do with him. Um, but it, with the book, it just it just did not work. They needed somebody else to come in and do it. Here, he just kills. He is meant to play uh, Montana the Barbarian. Um, and he does it so well. He does it so very well. There are characters that I think match the narrators. You know, this match, his voice, the story, it's a rare melding, narrator and author. Uh, but more importantly, it's really hard to get narrator and character to fit. And like I say, this is one of those things where I say, 
this is where Jeff Hayes and Quantum Hughes stand out. Because nobody, nobody, I don't care if it's Luke Daniels, Annelise Rene, uh, Andrea Parsno, uh, you, you name anybody else out there, they cannot do Quantum Muse the same way that Jeff does him. No way. Um, Justin Thomas James can't do Quantum Muse. Quantum Muse is a fast talking, you know, just glib SOB. Uh, and Jeff does that so well. He does that fast talk and he has the, the pep and the snark and everything. Just, it's so perfect. And, and here, Neil's, Neil's, Neil is the same way in regard to Montana. I think he is the barbarian. Uh, he and, and Montana really mesh really well. And after having read him for three books and listened to Neil for three books, I don't think I could see anybody else playing Montana uh, except Neil. Uh, they just they just go hand in hand together. Just perfect. They are a perfect melding of character and narrator, which is really rare. Really, really rare. Um, and so I, I just think he did a fantastic job. Um, this book on its own, um, like I say, the only negative that I had with it was the repetitiveness of the character sheets and the stats and things like that. Um, but it tones down later in the series. So I'm not going to hold out against it. Uh, and that's not really fair because I, I've read all three books at once and it's kind of all bludged right together there. But the fact is, um, this was just one of those books where I just could not stop. When I can't stop listening to a book, I know it's good. When I can't get away from book one to book two to book three, I know it's really good, at least for me. And I don't have that very often where a series just sucks me in that quickly. And the nice thing is, is that Eric puts out a book a month is the way it seems like. If you look at it, it was like one month there was a book, another month there was a book, next month there was a book, and I think the next month there was a book. So he's cranking these things out. Either he's got this thing really written well in advance, or he is just an amazingly fast writer who is really a good fast writer. Uh, and so he cranks these things out. He puts them out there, and it is just intense. I just wish. The only thing I say is that he would get better art for his covers because this series I can tell right now is taking a ding. It just boom, it's getting it's getting hit because the covers are not selling these like they should. Um he really needs better covers. And again, I'm not detracting the artist, but they aren't what I would call just amazing eye catching, eye popping, eye grabbing covers. They look like just like, you know, oh there there's a there's a barbarian with a back and he's holding his axe. Um, you know, even Nora Hazard, which we never see her face. We always see her backside. Um, and, and I think that's because Blaze Corbin, um, thinks that she's supposed to not be pretty. And so you just see her rear end. Uh, that's her best aspect. Even Blaze, um, has really good covers, even though you're just seeing the back of somebody. This, it doesn't look like he does any movement. There's no motion. It's just a movement of an arm changing position here or there where the axe is. So I'm not really a fan of those, but overall, Incredible book, incredible series, 8.5 stars. I love this book, every second of it, and I think you will too. All right, now we get to the Sound Booth Spotlight. And today, I'm going to be talking about Hero of Thera by Eric Nyland, narrated by the ever-amazing Jeff Hayes. Book length of 11 hours and 38 minutes. <clears throat> demon was difficult to see because it was pitch black against a backdrop of shadows. Yet, the longer I stared, the more the darkness popped from the flat dimension, taking on form and substance. Its tail elongated with a scorpion's stinger. The blank face widened with a Cheshire cat's grin. The body stretched and bat wings filled the cell, corner to corner. I stumbled away, back pressed against bars, trying to push farther away to no avail. The thing watched me with compound insect eyes. It then experimentally scraped talons over the steel toilet, producing sparks and a screech like rusty nails on a shattered blackboard. Oh, dear. I have the wrong body. My apologies. The darkness melted into flat shadow then blossomed into a thousand midnight black snakes that spilled into the cell, expanding and curling. Fanged mouths opened and snapped at the air. 
I screamed until my voice was a ragged bray. This is one of those books that I really do not understand how I hadn't gotten into it earlier. Uh, and then I thanked the gods and I just kind of tumbled onto it because book two only recently came out. Um, if I didn't have a book to fall back upon after this one, I would have been pretty disappointed. Uh, I'm really excited to have this as my sound booth spotlight just because this book stands out so very, very well. It's an incredibly written book, greatly narrated. I, I enjoyed this book to pieces. Um, first of all, the book starts off like every other little RPG novel you've ever read. A guy gets into a life and death game, working for a faction of evil uh, that he has no desire to join, but he has no choice. Okay, so maybe it isn't exactly like every other lit book out there, but it really does carry strong vibes of familiarity. Um, what the book does right is to differentiate itself early on so that it loses the I've seen this before vibe and accelerates into a holy cow, where are we going? Um, the premise is really pretty simple. Uh, a dude um, who was framed for a terrorist action, um, his name is Hector, uh, is approached by an evil force, Mr. Null, that offers him a chance to continue living. He's scheduled for ex execution later that day um, for committing a crime that he didn't commit. Um, kind of like Bruce Banner and the Hulk. And if you ever watched the old 70s Hulk thing, you know, Bruce Banner sought by police for a crime he didn't commit. Yeah, so, so it's the same thing here. He didn't commit the crime, but he got blamed for it, and so now he's in jail getting ready to be executed. Um, and he just figures the hell with it. You know, if I die, I die. I've already made my peace. I'll just go on to my afterworld and be happier. And Mr. Nall then informs him that as uh, Jesus had said to some people way back when, he says, as it is on earth, so it shall be in heaven. In other words, um, the conviction by a jury of 12 people, his peers, actually condemned his soul to the abyss. Who knew? Who knew that we had that kind of power here on earth? That even if you didn't do it, you did it. So that means that people that commit heinous crimes and are let off on technicalities have their sins washed away. That would probably piss off more, more of the abyssal lords than anything, I would think. Because you've got people just skirting the law. You're going to bribe a judge, you're going to do this you get away with it, well, then your hands are clean. So they've got this dude dead to rights. He's done all these horrible things, and he gets off. So he's, he's got nothing on his soul. So, uh, you know, I think the, the Abyssal Lords would kind of hate that more because I think they would have that happening way more often than the situation that Hector finds himself in where an innocent dude is condemned. And I know people talk about, all oh, these innocent people are on death row. I always say it's really, 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 really hard to get convicted for something you didn't do. Uh, you know, you weren't going to convict me for committing a murder that I was nowhere near because I, A, have usually got a really good alibi for wherever I'm at at any given moment, and B, I don't have a history of committing crimes, and C, um, you know, so on and so forth. Let me just say it like that. Um, you've really got to work hard to get yourself convicted. In other words, you've got to look bad. You've got to have history, so on and so on and so forth. Yeah, you got to go down the line. Most times. Now, I know sometimes that there are people that are innocent and they're misidentified and all that, and that's all I'm saying. But you would still say that if that was the case, that happens a hell of a sight less than the bad guys getting away with it. So the Abyssal Overlords, I don't think they would be really happy with the way our justice system was set up for the afterlife because they would be getting screwed right and left over, you know, getting souls. Um, so anyway, Hector is given this offer. It seems like, you know... Um, he can do what's called a free trial run of this version of the game. Now, the game is basically something that's been designed because when the universe was created, everybody wanted to be the ones to run it, and there was this big battle, and everything was about to be destroyed that had just been created. And so to avoid the destruction of everything, they decided, the powers that be, to create a world in which they would each have factions that vie for power. And whichever faction eventually dominated the game on Thera, Thera is the game world, um, would be the ones to rule the universe. And it's overseen by an actual game master, and everything in there is, is players. You've got so many players allowed into a faction at any given point, so on and so forth. So this is it. So he gets a, a trial run to come into the game to see how it plays and see if he's interested. Now, Hector is a gamer by trade. Uh, that's how he lives his life. He loves it. 
Uh, and so it really kind of goes right into it really quickly where he's like, this is great. I loved it. But I don't want to be a pawn of the Abyssal Lords. And so things occur. Don't want to spurl it for nobody. Things occur. Um, and, and things happen. But Hector ends up getting into the game. Um, so right after his free trial version, that's where the things get really interesting. Uh, the story just flies right ahead at like light speed. Uh, it introduces us to a great roster of characters. There's interesting scenarios. And a cool MC, Hector, who's class is the soul warrior and that's exactly what you think about if you've been reading up you grew up reading chop Saki films and you have i referred to it and i'll address that later in another segment i love chop Saki films and i'm not going to apologize for calling that uh, i think this is why usha and and um cultivation books appeal to me so much because i i grew up on those films and you know um kung fu the tv series and things like that so him being this really hardcore kick-ass martial artist it just it just it's perfect i i, I loved it um now hector saint savage is most importantly a likable character um he doesn't whine or bemoan his lot in life um he's only ever thinking about how to outwit his opponents or improve himself or maybe sometimes he reflects on the wrongs that he's done in the past um the only dark mark in my opinion on this whole book so far is that it sort of telegraphs what is going to happen at the end of the book, if you pay close attention. And it does that a couple of times where it telegraphs things. But you've really got to pay attention. And see, I do. Whenever I see something happen, like this pops up here, I say, why did that occur? Why did that happen? Why did he say that? Why did she do this? I, I pay attention to those things, and I start thinking, I'll say, well, the situation that we were handed at the beginning of this book was this. So why would this occur, this occur, this occur? And I put the things together, and I'm not saying I'm really smart, but sometimes it just becomes pretty clear to me the, the plot lines where they merge and not up together. Um, and so <clears throat> it, it wasn't something I'm sad about. In fact, I'm glad because it, it was something that they put that out there. It's kind of like um, if you watch any of this Seth Rogen and uh, James Franco movies, they pretty much tell you the entire movie somewhere at the beginning of the, the, the film. Like, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. In some stupid way, they, 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 remark, they, they make these remarks. And then that's exactly how it all comes into play. And they've done that in, in several movies. <clears throat> and it's, it's not bad. It's, sometimes I think it's fun or funny how they do that so that you can look to see what's going to happen. Um, but it happened here. Um, and like I say, I relished every second of the book. And I wanted the next book as soon as I put this one down. As soon as I put it down, I said, I have to have. So it was just one of those things where um, it wasn't a complaint, but I just said, you know, if you really pay attention, you'll know what's going to happen next or what's going to happen towards the end because there should be this happening. So pay attention as you go through this. Um, the narration here is handled completely by Jeff Hayes, and I have to say that of all the things I, 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 with Sound Booth Theater, I, I, I do love it most of all when one narrator deals with the story. Um, as much as I love the, the camaraderie uh, and the teamwork of all the players coming together to do voices and, and play people, and, you know, like Justin Thomas James and Rory Catherine Winkle, you know, bouncing off of each other with different voices, main, playing male and playing female leads, um, that's great. But there's just something for me about having one sole single individual narrator tell me a story. Uh, and especially when it's somebody as talented as Jeff Hayes. Uh, like I say, Jeff is, is my favorite narrator. I've, I've said this for years. I will continue to say it. Um, he does male and female voices so wonderfully. Um, I, you know, no matter what you think, um, he does lady voices just as good as ladies do. And, you know, I, I think Andrea Parsno is the only opposite mirror that I think that, and not that I'm putting anybody else down, but when it comes to women doing men's voices, she does a pretty good voice. If you ever listen to her do her stuff, she'll do those. And, and it, it's funny to hear her do it, but it's the same thing. I laugh when Jeff does his initially because it's just so, so spot on. And you say, how do they do this? And, and that's, that's the way I look at it here. Um, I just love having one narrator tell me a story. That's just the way it is. You know, back in the old days, you'd gather around the fire and you'd have one dude tell a story. And when you started having eight people throw in different things, then it became a play. And so I'm, I'm the, the campfire guy. I like to have the one guy 
telling me the story as it goes. I enjoy that a lot. And this was just a total pleasure for me to just sit down and chillax with Jeff for an evening. Um, and, and not that I relax for the evening. I'm, I listen to him while I work. Um, but you get the point. Um, it's just it's a really good good narration. He just, just nails it. Uh, you, you, you get to see everything he says visualized in your head. He does such a good job. And I'm always impressed with Jeff. So, you know, everything about this book was fun, exciting, humorous. And most importantly, it was heartfelt. And I think that's probably the best part about a Jeff Hayes solo book is how much heart and soul he puts into it when it's all by himself. Because not that he counts on other people to carry a book for him, but you can tell that this is his book. It's his book, and no one's taking that away from him. So my final score, and, and I, I even, uh, I'll say it like this, I'm probably going to go a little bit low because I know the next book is going to be so much better than this. I don't want to be like, well, this is like an 8.6 or 8.5. And so... Uh, the next book, i got to go higher and say, well, the last book was 8.6, and, and, and this one was better, so now this is an 8.9. I, I don't want to go that route. I want to keep it realistic. So this is 8.3 stars. I love this book. This is an incredible series so far. And, and I say that even though there's only two books out, and I've only read one book. I can tell you it's a really good series uh, just from this single, single novel. Uh, it is really captivating. It keeps your attention. It keeps your heart pounding, and it keeps you thinking. 8.3 stars. Okay, so this segment is a special segment that I just wanted to throw in um, just for fun. Um, it's called Ray's Pick, and I know I do, you know, what else have they done so that other authors and narrators can get other works they've done out there that you might not look at because it's not lit RPG or you know you might not realize they have other things out there. Uh, I also do the game worlds where I and you know show you know this is like the world that the game is set in and so on and so forth. And I have different segments that I like to in include every now and then that are just a little bit off of the lit perspective. And this is completely off of lit. So if you're not interested, just go ahead and, and skip this segment. Um, but this is going to be at the point where I talk about like a favorite series or a favorite book of mine um, that, that really stands out to me in some way. Um, and so it may be a single book, it may be a series, but it's going to be something that I have gone back to over and over and over again over the years uh, that I've enjoyed for, for numerous years. And I just want to share it with you all. Today's going to be uh, an audio book. And I'll explain everything about this in a minute here. Uh, called Assassin's Playoff by Warren Murphy and Richard Saber. Uh, narrated by Gray Gleason with a length of only 4 hours and 53 minutes. His name was Remo. And the fresh snow fell upon his open hand and he felt the flakes pile up. At the edge of the tall pine tree across the 300 yards to the yellow light coming from the cabin was fresh white, even snow, not even drifting in the windless late autumn evening in Bernadette, Minnesota. Remo had walked to the edge of the clearing, circling the cabin until he was sure. Now he knew. The perfect clearing in the Minnesota woods was an open field of fire. The assistant attorney general had made sure of that. If he didn't see anyone coming, then his dog would smell them. And from that cabin, anyone coming across that open blanket of white, by ski, by snowshoe, foot by foot, anyone, would be almost a stationary target in the yellow light cutting the November night. All right, so here, here's the deal. Um, for this series, this is the Destroyer series by uh, Murphy and Saper. Um, this is something I've been into since the 70s. I think I made it into the series right around book five is where I first found it. And the way I found the series was uh, my local comic book shop, which really wasn't a comic book shop. It was a little corner store that had a rack of comics, also sold pulp novels. Uh, so I had like, um, <clears throat> you know, different pulp books that I would get. And I've got favorite pulp series I used to read as a kid because I, I would get comic books off the rack. They only had so many that I would pick up. And then I would get like, you know, a pulp book or two. Um, and I'm a big Shadow fan and things like that. So old-time radio, pulp novels, those things really appeal to me as much as comic books do. And the Destroyer series really 
really stood out to me in just in a major way. I, I, I've been with this series forever. And one of the highlights of my life was when it actually became a film. Uh, and you can debate the greatness of the film or not. There, are, I think there are total gems, parts of that movie, and there's total parts of that movie that bore the hell out of you. Um, but you get the the essence of what it's about. Well, anyway, as you saw earlier, I had reviewed Hero of Thera, and it really made me nostalgic um, for my favorite series of all time, like my favorite pulp series, uh, and that's The Destroyer by Murphy and, and Saber. And I, like I said, you may have seen the film that's based off of it, um, which is Rebuild Williams' The Adventure Begins with Fred Ward, uh, and it even has uh, Joel Gray as Chun, the master of Sinanju. Uh, or even you may even have seen the, the TV pilot that starred Roddy McDowell, which is the star of Planet of the Apes and Fright Night fame. Um, and while I love both of the shows, the, the pilot and the movie, uh, they are, to the Destroyer series, what every other martial arts is to Sinanju. They're pale comparisons. Um, they are shadows made from light. Uh, now, for those of you who don't know what the book is about, the series, because it's it's a series and, and you're not going to be able to just pick up one book and say, I know everything about this. Although you technically could because it's a pulp style book and they kind of give you the entire format over and over and over again. Uh, it's like those old time radio shows. If you ever listen to um, Judy Canova, there's there's things that she does every single show. She gets up, she meets her maid, she goes out, she she sees her gardener, she goes, you know, so on and so forth. It's it's a repetitive thing. And they just have jokes based on those different events. Well, this is the same thing. You have a bad guy do something, Cure finds out about it, they... they send Remo and Chun to, to deal with it. There's some scuffle, kerfuffle, and then it's dealt with and they move on to the next thing. <clears throat> but basically, Cure is a secret governmental organization uh, that actually does its job. Uh, it is designed and built to act outside of the laws of the United States in a good way. Um, because what they do is they take out enemies of the United States, criminals, all around bad guys, that um, if you did it legally, it would just be impossible to achieve. Like, you know, you know, somebody's going to have a really good lawyer and they're going to weasel out of whatever they did or they're going to pay somebody some money and they're going to bribe somebody and they're going to get away with it. Well, Cure stops all that right here, right now. Um, and the assassins, which is what Chun and Remo really are, they're the greatest assassins in the world, um, they do it in a way that it usually looks like an accident, although sometimes not so much. Uh, <clears throat> so... Cure is really out there to do things like maybe stop a war or even fight a vampire. Uh, you never know. So this is one of those things that um, I love about the series is that it could be a James Bond style fight in one novel. And then you've got some crazy ass robot that's out to destroy the world. And actually, that's that's actually a really um, prevalent thing. I think it was three novels spaced out over a period of time about a sentient robot that, you know, it started off as a program, it became sentient, and so on and so forth, before they had to stop it. Um, and there's actually ethical dilemmas, like, should we stop this? Is it really evil? That sort of stuff. Um, and and that's one of the things I really like about the series, is it's not just, like, they go out and they kill people. There's definitely things that, that go into the series that you don't get from something in the 70s. And what it really is, is... And I'm big on this. If you, you listen to me talk about um, the Good Guys series, Good Guys Book 1, um, one more last time, I'm really big on serialized stories. You know, TV shows, movies. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those guys that grew up with watching uh, the old, old pulp serials from the, the 40s. You know, Captain Marvel and Batman. Um, so two Batman films that predated the Tim Burton or the Adam West movies, uh, they were serials, and I've seen those. I saw those when I was a kid, and it was not easy to take care of, but I, I, I did it. Um, and so, you know, serial things really appeal to me in a major way. And so, you know, the, the whole premise of the, 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 the series is one long, detailed story. Now, you could call it a slice of life, but everything is self-contained, so you get the, the satisfaction of this is put away and done. If it's not done, you know there will be two more books, maybe three more books, based on that premise before it gets tidied up as well. Because they don't ever leave anything hanging. They close up every thread there is. Uh, but they build. So what you see Remo doing here, he is much better here. There's never, you know, well, he goes backwards or he doesn't, he, he just treads, you know, treads water for a while. 
he's always improving. And that's so in, in one way, it's kind of like lit where he levels up periodically um, because he does improve and, and change. And, and but this is like the only book you'll ever see where eating a hamburger can kill a guy. Okay, uh, because Remo almost died from eating a hamburger after he had purified his body for Sinanju. Um So that's one of those things. The only thing I really found negative about the whole series was that because hamburgers should be the greatest thing ever, no matter what your body is built to design, you know, to take in. It, it should be the greatest food in the world. Um, I can't imagine. And that's why I, I can never be a, a, a master of Sinanju because I have to have steak. Just that's just the rules. There's steak, potato, sour cream. That's it. That's my that's my life. Um, take that away from me. I'd rather not be doing anything. Um, anyway, like I say, they do have a semi lit feel, uh, but the truth of the matter is, this is really more of one of the first Usha series uh, before there ever was Usha or Wuxia or whatever you want to call it, um, because it really is about a guy who who builds himself up internally with you know his own power and gets stronger and stronger over time um, so you can call it cultivation or usha but this is there before that ever happened uh, at least in the united states i mean honestly if you you look at the states back then they were not big into asian culture um, if they were it was chop sake flicks and yes i'm going to call them chop sake flicks I grew up with them on that you know there's black exploitation films although they didn't call it black exploitation back then i don't believe but um Chop Saki was the terminology we used when we would say, let's go to the movies and watch Chop Saki flick. That's what we did in the 70s. We would go watch Kung Fu people with the bad lip sync overdub and all that. Uh, we would catch all that stuff. And that was what I, I would see. That's what I watched. And so it is no disrespect to anybody when I say that. But that's just the way it is. I love those films. I grew up on those. Uh, you know, 36 Chambers and you name it. I've seen it. I have lived through it. I and th this is really the heart of those those movies and i don't know if that's what inspired them or not but it really is um kind of a key component to this it's it's, it's just like kwai kwai chang kane walking the earth as a, as a shaolin monk um the one things if he had superpowers and that's just about the best way I can do it. But they don't wander the earth. They have their, their little missions they get to. Um, now, here's where my, my, the crux of my problem comes in is Assassin's Playoff uh, completes a series of encounters that Remo and a former student of his master, Chun, have. And, and the, the student is named Nyuk. And Nyuk is Chun's nephew, his, his blood relative. Um, and he betrayed Chun, and he also uh, disgraced Sinanju to a point where Chun's name was Nyuk, and he actually flipped his name around to avoid the shame. Uh, he reversed his own name. So when you first meet Chun, his name really wasn't Chun, it was Nyuk, but he had changed it. Um, <clears throat> and Nyuk is nearly as powerful as Chun. He's pretty good. He hasn't been taught everything, but he's way, way better than Remo in, in, in steps and bounds and leaps and all that sort of thing. And they, they, they pair off a, a couple, three times before this novel. This novel is the end of it. So you're saying, Ray, why don't you tell me about one of the better novels that have these, these face-offs or he's first introduced? And that's because, for some bizarre reason, they really only have three of these books on audio. So technically, what I'm doing is is I'm advocating you to go out and get some Kindle books, e-books, um, because they're cheap, they're easy, and 99% of them are available on Kindle. I think up to 70 or 80, um, the novels are in, up up to that point, and then they cut off. Um, and I'll explain why in a little bit here, too. But um, the vast majority of the novels are on Kindle but only a handful are on Audible, and I do not know why that is. It does not make sense to me, but that's just the way it is. So I had to pick something um, that would work, and I couldn't do Forgotten Son because that's the new series by Warren Murphy before he died, uh, which deals with um, Remo's children, uh, and they're really good, uh, but they only got one audiobook, uh, and the other one is Slave Safari, and it's, it's a good book, but it's not really... It, I don't know, it's not a good example of what I would think you would want to listen to. Whereas this, I, I think it, it is probably the better of the, the ones that we have to choose from. And the problem I have is, is with this book is that really you don't get to see any of 
the, the abilities that Chun, Remo, or Nook really have uh, because they don't show us very much. Uh, the fact of the matter is is that um, Nook comes after Remo with suicide bombers. They're, they're, they're suicide attacks by people that he's tricked into thinking they can take Remo out because he, they've been trained so well. And each attack really kind of whittles Remo down, but he only has to do like one move to stop them because they're just they're amateurs. And so you don't get to see like a lot of the, the, the fighting or the mystical aspects of things. It just kind of goes back and forth between the attacks and him trying to figure out what the hell's going on. And therein lies the rub because the, the, the best parts of these books are when Remo and Chun use their abilities. Like, you know, they dodge bullets or they catch bullets or they, they, they run through fire or they walk on water or they run up walls or whatever it is, you name it. Um, it's kind of like Naruto before Naruto ever came in being. Uh, you know, Naruto uses chakra while well, they just use their own inner power. Uh, and they just do what they've got to do and they move right along. And, and it's, like I say, this was the, the precursor to all of those things. I would almost dare to say that I could see that this, this influenced some of the people in Japan or Asia. If they ever read these novels, they would say, well, this is, you know, similar to stuff that we do but with components that we don't use just yet. And so they, they fused those things together because of when they did this and, and so on and so forth. I could be wrong because I'm not really into translated Asian books. I haven't read them, and I don't know what they had out of that period in time. But I'm going to say I think I could see this being an influence on them to a certain extent. I'm not saying that it was a, a huge thing or anything like that, but I could see it being there um, and having its effect on that culture as well. Um, so... Like I say, this is not the premier book, so what I'm doing is I'm advocating for this series rather than this specific novel. Now, um, if you do decide to check this out, skip the first three books. Um, it's a lot like the Dresden series. Before I ever got where I realized that Dresden existed and I got the first book, um, after I'd gotten through it, uh, it was, I was probably about book eight or nine in, and, and I would start going on to the, the Facebook pages and things like that, and people were like, oh, well, if you're, you're new to it, Skip the first three books or the first two books. Uh, they're the weaker of the novels, and book three or four picks up right where it should be, and you'll be used to it, and you'll say, wow, this is great. And then you can go back and read those first two because they, they can slot in anywhere the way they're designed. And I think that's the same thing here. Um, the problem with these books, um, the first two or three books, was that Saber and Murphy really didn't have a clue where they were going with the character. They didn't know if it was going to be a James Bond using Kung Fu or, or whatever it is to solve problems. Um, you know, were they going to infiltrate just like organizations and take them down and, and so on and so forth. They didn't have the legs that the series finally stood on until book four. Um, so, like I say, start off around that point and go forward. Um, on ebooks, uh, and then if you want to go back and, and you know, because I had to do it, you know, like I said, I, I picked up like book five, and that's where I had been for my whole life until years ago when the Kindle first came out, um, and, and so I had to go back and look and see, and I can I can say yeah, I mean the first book, it, it gives you all the the origin story if you're an origin person, um, but it just does not feel like a Remo Chun novel. It doesn't feel like the Destroyer. Uh, it feels like something that could become that, but it's not quite there yet. Uh, another issue, and I'm going to just be frank when I say this, is that the books can be construed as being sexist and a little lightly racist. And by what that, by that I mean, and I, I'm going to say it as best I can, um, when I was a kid, the term Oriental was used primarily for anything from Asia. Uh, but when I was a kid, I also learned that oriental was a rug and asian was a person and i don't think that warren murphy or richard saper ever kind of caught on to that because every time they refer to anything from that part of the world or the people from there they'll they'll, they'll refer to chun as being the oriental guy that comes into the room um so it's going to be like that however they're very respectful of the asian culture uh, you know, Chun is superior in every way to everybody, and he never fails to remind them of that. Uh, he really kind of goes to town telling them how great he is every chance he gets, um, because he is great. I mean, he's great, and he knows it. Um, 
so you know they have a respect for the people there um but that can be off-putting to some people and the sexism is pretty rampant um even with chun the women are to make babies they are to take care of the men they are to care of the household and that's it with that being said there are several points in the series where there are prominent, powerful female characters that come into play. In fact, one of them uh, eventually births Remo's daughter. Um, <clears throat> so there are there are things that they they act this way, but then they still give you powerful female characters. And I can't say that it always ends well for these characters. But then if you read the series, really the only people that survive anything at any point for any period of time is the the leader of cure the you know <laughs> the, the emperor uh <laughs> smith and then remo and chun everybody else is just cannon fodder and i think that's where i get my whole thing with with uh you should just kill characters off because that's what they're there for uh because that that series taught me that no one's life is sacred and in real life that would be the way it played out so i think that's it but yeah i mean it's it's lightly racist and probably moderately sexist uh, so if you can't overlook it skip it um but i think it's, it's just as worthy as you would hope um it, it, it is complete pulp complete pulp nothing but fun fights cool martial arts actions and even father-son relationship dynamics between chun and remo that are just incredible they're hilarious you, you will never hear such banter uh, you know and not laugh um as, as you do here gray gleason is absolutely amazing as a narrator and i will say that for this book in the audio portion this guy is really good really good um great sound effects and sadly the problem is is that th this is like the only books series that he's done he's got like three books out i think um and i can't believe that because he does an incredible job he really should be doing more audio and if i were an up-and-coming author i'd have my eye on this dude um while audio does kind of have not have a lot of the audible stuff for destroyer um you can find believe it or not about 20 cds from graphic audible graphic audio that does have the destroyer tales on them and they pick up from like book 100 on uh and there's there's a reason why because there was a point like after book 70 or 75 or something like that there was a big kerfuffle and saper and murphy were out and the series continued, but it was not the same. It was really crappy. Um, and then around issue 100, Saper and Murphy came back. So if you, you pick up the, the, the first book, the 100th novel uh, from Graphic Audible, you should be right where they, they left off at. And, you know, so you know it's just as good as the first 75 or 80 books that they did in the series uh, with the interim of those few 15 or whatever it is. And again, I can't tell you exactly where that was because um, I haven't gotten to that point. I've only read up to about 60 or 65 books, I think, in that novel series because they're hard to find. And even on um, Kindle, they don't go through the whole series. Uh, at least they didn't when I first got my Kindle. They may now. I, I, I don't know. I haven't been reading books. I've been listening to audio for years. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty nice. So you can get those on graphic audio uh, if you're really interested. Now, my only caution is, is this really isn't the book to break in on. Um, it doesn't do a lot to explain the skill sets they have. Uh, but I do recommend a series, uh, you know, like you say, on Kindle or, you know, whatever. Or even start the Forgotten Sun. Forgotten Sun is really good. It's enjoyable. Either way, this is probably one of my most cherished series that I've ever read. And like I say, if you're an Usha fan, Luxia, however you want to pronounce it, then this is really going to be perfect for you because this is exactly those kind of books uh, with some racism and sexism thrown in. So give it a look if you're interested. Well, I would like to thank you all for listening, watching, however you do this. Uh, I do appreciate you taking the time to do so. Uh, if you want to support the show, as always, I will tell you you can like the Lit RPG Podcast Facebook page or the YouTube page or just like and share the videos. Uh, I sincerely hope you've enjoyed our show. Uh, please leave comments or suggestions in the comment section below, right down there, Gilbert. And feel free to tell me whatever you think. I enjoy the feedback. Remember, as always, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. Uh, so 
give those a uh, good look if you can, uh, and, and make sure to uh, leave feedback for us. We deeply appreciate that whenever you have an opportunity to do so. So thank you. Take care. For the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast, I am Ray. Please keep listening.